Welcome to the Brand Shorthand Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Vandergrift, and with me today is the positioning protagonist, Lorraine Kessler. Lorraine, big news in the world of Starbucks, since we mm-hmm. seem to bring them up so often. Yeah. The, they have a new CEO. It's okay. the former CEO of Chipotle, Brian Nickel. Oh. Did you hear about that? No, I haven't. I've been out of the loop on, even though I've been following Starbucks, I missed that one. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. they were due for a change because they've seen a 40% drop in market valuation since their high in 2021. Oh, which, okay. You know, the only word I have for that is coffee apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty good word, actually. Uh, yeah. I think we should trademark that. But I think I understand why. And it just happened to me this week. So, um, you know, those that listen probably won't know where we're referencing. But Lorraine, I think you might. Have you been in the Starbucks at Washington Square ever across from Walsh College? Um, Yeah, way back. Yeah. Okay, way back. Mm -hmm. You remember you walk in the counters on the right and you have all this seating area. Right. Well, I walked in there this week. Boom, there's a counter and nothing else. The whole place was turned into a kitchen or coffee prep area other than two bathrooms off to the left. But there couldn't have been 10 feet before you hit the counter. They took all the signage off of the walls. It's like a stale gray. Um, It feels like you're walking into a reception area at a hospital. And the only thing they had, get this, was a digital sign. On the left, it says order received. In the middle, it says order being made. And on the right, order ready for pickup. And it almost looks like, you know, when you, you see the hospital signs where it yeah. says checked in, yeah. you know, next up and yeah. in surgery or something. I don't know what they are. But, you know, it makes me think that we always talk about Starbucks hitting the highest level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and that self-affirmation, right? Starbucks, the cup is my identity. Right. They invented the coffee experience. Experience is key. Yeah. And And yet, you know, at the same time, we also talk about, you, you mentioned this recently on the last three or four episodes is you have to be nimble because definitions change. Like I think last time, uh, we talked about the definition of quality and mm-hmm. Tupperware, right? right? The definition of quality has changed. So is it the fact that maybe coffee experience has changed and we have so many competitors? You know, I just think it's interesting that they hired the former CEO of Chipotle, which by my recollection was the first fast food place to push a feeling of that professionalism or modernism instead of the family friendly feeling that you get. So I was just curious, maybe you haven't had a lot of time to think about this, but do you think he's going to take them back to the coffee experience or do you think he'll push for this coffee as a transaction approach? As a transaction, you brand, you have just squeezed any brand value out of it. Okay. So I would encourage our viewers and those who are listening to Google on YouTube, Porn and Hard Art. It's a documentary. I think Mel Brooks is featured in it. And that chain of restaurants, which was about the turn of the century, with two guys, Horn and Hard Art, had all about an experience for migrants who were coming to the immigrants who were coming to this country who didn't quite all speak the same language and how they could convene and how they could be treated with quality and have food and convene and be in community. And that was Howard Schultz's inspiration. He's in the documentary. Mystifying. That to me is the DNA that Starbucks has week by week, year by year, month by month, whatever, just winnowed out, out of this idea that they're supposed to be a transactional brand. I think it's totally been the wrong way. Will Brian Nickel turn it around? I don't know, because I think Chipotle's had its own fault. As I understand, yeah, um, they've had some health problems. They've had some other things. I like their new commercials. They're back to food fresh and how it's prepared and made every day. And in the same vein, I would encourage our viewers and listeners to Google Sebastian Maniscalco uh, bit that he does on the subway <laughs> and how they prepare your food because <laughs> uh, it's funny as hell. How does this work here? What do you do? <laughs> It says step one, big bread. You don't see that? <laughs> How do you make a sandwich at home? <laughs> what, do you just start throwing ham all over the table? 
so that tells me that they uh, achieved some sort of celebrity status when a celebrity comedian is able to make fun of your process for how you put your food together. But I, I don't know. Um, what you just said to me is uh, 180, the wrong direction. And yeah. I think I would do what Duncan did a few years ago. If you remember, Duncan closed 800 stores a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And they got, I forget what store they were within. They were within a store that really didn't reflect the brand. And they got rid of 450 of those stores. Um, the, sometimes, Speedway is who it was. Oh, yeah. Totally wrong place to be in. But that what's, who, what says more transactional than Speedway? And yeah. by the way, I hope you don't get food poisoned. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, they, they did the hard thing. They rationalized their stores. They rationalized their line. And they're stronger than ever. Um, so if if I were in Starbucks, I'd be looking at Duncan. I'd see the template, how they're trying to bring a greater experience to some of the meal times that they serve, like breakfast. Uh, and I would put I would put my money more on that than in trying to do whatever ha happened in Washington Square. Yeah. Well, and the one down the street, the other way down Whipple is just the drive through. Yeah. They have a walk up window, but it's only a drive through. Yeah. This we know where this comes from, right? Yeah. It's greed. It's just. It's just money and speed and make it fast as if that's the only thing these customers value. Meanwhile, look at all the little uh, coffee experience hubs or businesses. Some are regional, some are local that have grown up, that have people convening in the morning with their computers and enjoying a Danish and having really great coffee and conversation with the barista. Um, that's where I'd want to be. Yeah, we have a ton of them around here. The Ohio Coffee Roasters is a great place. Great place. Mugwits. Mugwits. Um, yeah. Who else recently has gone in? Um, oh, Car Carpe Diem has been around for a while. So yeah. all these places that are fantastic for that coffee experience where people convene. Right. And it's almost like Starbucks said, okay, folks, I set this up for you. You run with it. We're going a different way now. Well, and I don't understand because they're such a smart company in so many ways. And yeah. but um, you know they've they've made some dumb political moves. We know that's right. Yep. Um, but the thing is that um, you have two segments of customers. You have that customer who I just need to get my coffee on my way to work and I need it quick. And why can't you have an express lane totally mm -hmm. dedicated to that? And then you have the customer who's like you know wants to be like Lazy Boy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. We just we talked about Lazy Boy in another uh, one of our podcasts. They just want to uh, hang out. They want to yeah. do their work there. They want to see some people. They want to be seen. They want to relax. They want to have a true I think what this was supposed to be is an Italian coffee experience. So mm -hmm. I don't know why you can't serve both. Yeah. Well, the topic at hand isn't quite that, but mm -hmm. I think that might be what Starbucks is chasing, and that's brand homogenation. Yeah. Now, let me define that for our listeners. If if anybody knows the word homogenation, it's basically making things the same, homo. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the kind of being like. Mm -hmm. And so brand homogenation um, is making all brands very similar to one another, following what they're doing from anything to starting with the logo mm -hmm. to the slogan to the fonts that are being used, to even the advertisements. Mm -hmm. And these companies seem to be going in the opposite direction of positioning, which is about differentiation, and instead making them look and feel and be nearly identical to other brands. Yeah. So I'm going to start this off a little differently here. Rather than have you wax eloquently on this. We'll get there. <laughs> but I'm going to give you a slogan for a big brand name and you try to tell me which brand it goes to. You ready? Yeah. Okay. The first one up is, or the first one is up for whatever. <laughs> Again, it's the Titan, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a big brand name. It's a big brand. It's one of our favorites. We've been up, we beat up on them a lot. Oh, gosh, I have no clue. You will never connect it to this. Bud Light. Oh, yeah. Up for right. whatever? Up for whatever. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> okay, number two. Yeah, do we have a buzzer? Yeah, we'll have, we'll have Denver work that in for us. Yeah. Okay. Um, so number two is the power of dreams. Oh, yeah. Uh, power of dreams. Okay. <laughs> 
Is that a is that a cannabis ad? We. <laughs> 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 it's for Honda. Oh, yeah. I thought Honda right away. Right. Oh, Honda. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That really, all I know is in our market, there's been a lot of motorcycle accidents. Really? Well, bad. maybe they were dreaming. Maybe they were dreaming. The power yeah, they were asleep at the wheel and, and dreaming. The power of nightmares. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Here's another one for you. Ready? It's one mm -hmm. word health thing. Oh, that one. That one's terrible. That one's terrible. That's yes, who that belongs to. I think it's Lysol, but yep. it's terrible. I hate it. <laughs> well, me. you at least got it. I didn't yeah. think you would get that one. No. I didn't know. I didn't know it when Denver challenged me with it. Because I'm a clean fanatic. I'm an OCD clean. Yeah. I turned into my mother. I don't know how this has happened. Yeah. Um, and John has turned into my the other half of my mother because he's obsessed with trash. <laughs> it can never be a speck of trash in the trash cans in the house before it being taken outside. It's yeah. well, it, in my opinion, okay, this is my opinion. Again, the same reason I had an opinion about Starbucks not doing well, mm -hmm. but brand homogenation seems to be coming more widespread in recent years. And I, I think this is the reason mm -hmm. is there's this set of advertising execs and all they're doing is changing positions. That's so this guy that was here, like even the CEO of Chipotle is over at Starbucks now, right? Right. right? So what is he going to do? He's probably going to take everything he did at Chipotle and do it at Starbucks and say, well, it worked there. We ought to do it here. And I think this tier of advertising exec, execs, all they do is switch positions within these companies. Yeah. And so you're starting to get brands that look the same, logos that look the same, slogans that look the same. It's just like a me too thing. And you've always said it's basic human nature to copy. If I do this right. and scratch right. my head, you're going to do it. Right. But I think there's a layer additional to this. And that's these individuals that are just swapping positions. Sure. And now they're just starting to all like think alike, be alike. They're robots. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other examples of this going on right now off the top of your head? Well, examples of it, uh, reasons for it, I think you hit one, that's uh, the, the recirculation of same people with same thoughts within mm -hmm. a category, right? So, uh, and they're not being strategic about it. Um, I think the other thing is there's a sense of how do we play it safe, right? Like, mm -hmm. th if this worked here, then it should work here. Um, and so, but I would say that in marketing, playing it safe is the most dangerous strategy of all. Yeah. It is for sure to do what we're talking about is homogenization. Um, and so it it's becomes like, I mean, I have to think off the top of my head what brands are really homogenized, but um, there's some that stand out and that are not. For example, John Deere to me stands out, right? But every other, and there's a lot, Cub Cadet, and they all mesh together for me. Yeah. And I think in a lot of the tool business, there's a lot of homogenization. They're not standing out the way they used to. They well, don't have the kind of distinction they used to have. Yeah, the one that always jumped out to me, and I thought the original was really good, which was Charmin's mm -hmm. for the go, Yeah. right? That was their tagline. Yeah. But the second I saw an ad for Hilton's, yeah. which was for the stay. For the stay. I'm yeah. like, you so ripped that off. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we could put a for the whatever and fill in the blank. Yeah. Right. For the morning, yeah. for the, for, for the, for the people, <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, for the children. I mean, you can you can finish the sentence. So this is yeah. where formula takes over. If you can turn it into a formula like that, it's a pretty good bet that you're on the wrong track. I think. Well, do you remember the Got Milk campaign? Yeah. And how many things came out of that? I mean, oh, they yeah. even pulled it into the church. Got Jesus? Yeah. It's just, uh, uh, what do we call that? What do we call that? It's laziness. It's a, it's a, it's lazy to the point of unwilling to create your own original differentiation. Yeah. That's, that's my opinion. Yeah. I mean, some people go, no, it works. Why wouldn't we apply it to ours? But that's immediate when, immediately when someone sees it, they're going to understand that you ripped it off. Yeah. So now your credibility just went down yeah. the tank. Yeah. It's, it's a bad, it's a bad habit. I hate to say it. Yeah. I think, I think I, I did that once too. Uh-oh. 
uh, I think I think uh, I was the uh, one behind advertise responsibly, which was oh rip off. That's all right. I'm... We can call ourselves sometimes as being off. <laughs> Very good. Well, you. you know, you admitted it. Yeah. So. I admit it. Well, we'll put some samples on screen here too, but yeah. um, you can take some brands like Pringles or Lamborghini. Yeah. Where they just trim their logo down to a black and white version. Yep. And a lot of them are beginning to blend in with each other and even with brands from other markets. Yeah. One of the things uh, I noticed and I was totally confused is um, there's this new vehicle that every time I see it, I love the style and it's Genesis. And is that, is that Hyundai's high end brand mm -hmm. Genesis, but their logo looks just like the mini Cooper. It yeah, it does. Like, I think it's Chrysler. Um, there's like three or four automotive logos that have that airplane kind of look and we should mm -hmm. find those because I was just like, what am I looking at here? I was trying yeah. to figure out and the, the way that they do their full logo with the word on the back of a vehicle, the Genesis is so spaced out. You can't read it easily, mm -hmm. right? Cause there's too no. much um, kerning between the letters. Yeah. But, um, and I'm seeing this mark and I'm like, I've seen that mark before. And he says, Chrysler is <laughs> Mini this, Cooper. Yeah. Mini Cooper. Like, what is this vehicle? I'm yeah. So, uh, and that's a really good example. But the other thing is we, you can go through um, logos in the 2000 era, the nineties, the eighties, the seventies. And now. Um, and I remember everybody had kind of a, a swoop, mm -hmm. kind of a, some version of a circular swoop, something in a swoop a sphere of some kind. Um, God, if I see another one of those, I mean, just, I'm just going to implode. <laughs> right? Well, I think they're doing it with buildings too. Um, when I was driving up on Apple Grove uh, mm -hmm. in North Canton there, um, there's a building going up and I don't know which fast food place it is, but it, I literally think it could be one of about 12. Yeah because they're all starting to look the same. It, it looks like a, a Starbucks drive through but it could also look like a Wendy's drive through and it could also look like a McDonald's drive through mm -hmm. I mean, you remember McDonald's yep. when their arches went clear to the ground yep. and the shape of the building, you just knew it was a McDonald's. Even yep. our own client, remember Altman, yep. with their the way they did their uh, overhangs, yep. they had the A in it, right? Yep. And they still have that so yep. that they're building is branded yeah but all the fast food places seem to be going into these gray box just you know there's a variation in terms of some of the roof line yeah but they slap this junk manufactured stone on it it goes up in about three months if maybe not faster right and so there's nothing in the whole experience that says we are separating ourselves from the competition we're not even separating ourselves from any other distinct kind of uh, industry. That's and right. we know with positioning, the whole point is to make your brand and your company and your people and your buildings and your whatever other asset you have stand apart. Wouldn't you, I mean, wouldn't you agree that what we're seeing today is going against the principles of positioning? Well, I think the best, by and large. Yeah, I think the best uh, testament to homogenization is my husband did a lot of business in China and occasionally he would bring the Chinese executives who ran the manufacturing plants here to the States. So they would be traveling from New York to Ohio to Mississippi, right, to California. And you mm -hmm. know what their comment was? All these towns look exactly alike. Yeah. Because all of the fast food, all the food franchises, they could not get over the homogenization. Huh. So sometimes it takes new eyes to see. Like they yeah. didn't know. They actually said they didn't know at some point what where they were, like if they were in Ohio or Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Now, we think of those as extremely different uh, areas and cultures. But yeah. by the visual, the highway, and what's off the highway, you can imagine that. So, and, yeah. and you know, look, it, it cracks me up that we're in this capitalistic free market society. You go to the airport, people get off a crowded plane. Tell me how many suitcases do you see that are not black? <laughs> not many. Right. So people have to tie shit around their um, handles so they know it's theirs. I'm like, we could have choice unlimited, but we normalize. We normalize. Yeah. And so there's yeah. this urge to copy. It's much more powerful than we think it is. And it's yeah. very dangerous in marketing. Well, and tech markets right now are really going that way. Of all the places that I think of being mm -hmm. 
kind of inventive and innovative. Yeah. Uh, right now you have Microsoft, Spotify, and Pinterest all going to this like basic bold font. And then one that needed a refresh was eBay, but they also use the same bold font. Right. So I think it's very interesting and contrasty to this individualized identity politics climate that America has today mm -hmm. versus the homogenization. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think here's one of the things like go through any creative department. And what will you see? You'll see books of uh, the new trends and logos and designs and whatever. And and then guess what you're going to see come out of that is is iterations of those things. Because everybody wants to be on style. They don't want to create new style. Right. Right. So there's a safety in that. There's a safety in like, well, this is where everybody is. So I'm going to be there because that's good taste. Yeah. But there's not safety in inventing new taste and breaking out. And we see it in design and colors. I mean, there's color palettes, right? I mean, and what Joanna Gaines, God bless her, did Magnolia for the housing market. I mean, I have seen, I, I hope I see the last of every white and black house. It's going to be built, <laughs> right? Right? Yep. You're going to look back. I'm telling you right now, people, you're going to look back and say that was 2020. Or 2015 yeah. to 2020, right? Just like in the 80s and 90s, all the houses had like a brick facade with an oval window at the top. That was the 80s and 90s. Uh, it just, it, it becomes stuck in time rather than yeah. time is. We're going to see ship laugh in our, in our <laughs> nightmares. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I am on a rampage to bring color back into my house. You know, <laughs> I have seen every single house with white woodwork and gray walls. And it's like, you know, come on, people. There's, yeah. there's a world of color out here. Yeah. We can have fun. We can have fun. Well, I, I have seen some arguments in favor of stylistic trends, mm -hmm. which I think are justified, but I think we can pull them off without getting homogenation. Yeah. So the first is that the fonts that these brands are converting to are very easy to read over computers and phones mm -hmm. and anywhere that text gets shrunken down. So some of the big swoopy letters of some brands might not be very legible in cases like that. And the other point I found, and part of that's accessibility. So we have a new cry for making things accessible for people, which I'm all about, right? Yeah. But I think there's a way to do that without making everything look the same. Sure. And then the other point that I found was as brands become more global, there's a need for brands and logos and type to be able to be read or at least recognized by people of different languages. So they may not do the translation, but they want something that's short and easy to read and the topography is not too crazy. I don't know. Those are the only two things that I could see as far as setting trends toward what we're seeing with homogenization. But I think at the same time, we could probably get to a point where you can still differentiate at that level. Yeah. I mean, there's always an opportunity to differentiate. And I think yeah. that's the harder challenge because you use the word lazy, right? Um, this yeah. is where you can't be lazy and you really have to exhaust many possibilities. And I think particularly when you're in the creative side of things, um, why not? Mm -hmm. Right. Go from, you know, we, we used to like to do this and I, and I advise clients to insist on this. I want to see, particularly, let's say we're doing a logo revision. I want to see your logo where it is. And then I want to see the extreme to where it can go on one end and others that are closer, like see, see an evolution from mm -hmm. this is pretty close. This is pretty close. This is pretty close. And then you get further and further out and show the range. Now, um, the place that's dangerous is obviously we know this on package goods because the logo is such an identifier. If it's a well-known brand, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a well-known brand, you only want to take an evolutionary approach because you want people to still recognize Tide as Tide, Dove as Dove, you know, Smith's Milk as Smith's Milk. You don't want to get so far afield that they think it's under new management, something's happened, this mm -hmm. isn't the product. I like, but for a lot of our clients, particularly B two B, they have really bad logos to begin with, mm -hmm. right? Um, or, or it's just it's just not aesthetics are a language, so the aesthetics aren't there for a lot of either startups or small companies or business to business. And I think that's an opportunity where you can kind of stretch that and show yeah. someone a spectrum and be brave. Just go somewhere wild and see what happens because there might be one piece of that 
that ends up being genius and Mm -hmm. can make all the difference on um, a a piece that is more uh, familiar to the audience or the owner. So Lorraine, get out Mm -hmm. your crystal ball. Yeah. And get out your Joanna Gaines mindset here. And we have a bunch of brands right now that are being homogenized. Okay. Well, good. Okay. Where does this end? Do we (laughs) see that even though these brands are successful today, they're not tomorrow? Or do we just see a new style come out in the future and they all move that way together? Or do we actually get back to differentiation? What do you think? Well, I think we're going to continue to see what we see because we've seen it for the history of advertising. If you go back and study advertising from 1910, 1920, 30, you'll see that the styles were all within a range of what was known in that time for familiarity, for the type of font, a lot of uh, a lot of cursive fonts yeah. because people wrote in cursive um, and things like that. So I think we're going to continue to see a lot of sameness. I don't, I don't, the breakthrough brands will always be the breakthrough brands and um, kudos to them. And I hope that um, particularly if you're a new startup and you're a new brand, this is the time to really fight for being differential in your logo, in your identity. These are, these are the identifiers of the brand. They're not the sum total of the brand. Rarely does a logo um, convey a meaning. Um, Mm -hmm. It can convey a feeling like trust or happiness or joy um, or fluidity, but it rarely conveys a true meaning. So, um, but I I guess if I were, my advice would be if you're business to business um, and if you're the, you have more range, if you're business to business, a startup or an unfamiliar brand, um, you have much more range to kind of really be bold and, step into a place that you wouldn't think you would normally go. Well, I, for one, will be very happy when all these ads Mm -hmm. that have people dancing in the stores or in the streets, singing very bad songs, (laughs) go away. (laughs) Because there are drug commercials. I I, think about Target not long ago. Um, Home Goods has it. Uh, You name it. All these different brands right now, they have people break out into the street and they're dancing and they're singing. And it's like, oh my goodness. I don't want to see another one of these ads because it's just... uh, It can hurt your liver, your heart. You could have diabetes. You could have paralysis, gastrointestinal disease. Yeah, but we're all dancing in the street. We're all happy. Um, You know, I'm old enough to remember, Mark, when you could pharmaceuticals could not advertise direct to consumer mm-hmm. that changed around the 80s somewhere and i think when you look at the amount of advertising spent by big pharma i'm really anti big pharma mm-hmm. it's got america by the chokehold yeah um particularly with this weight loss stuff we don't even know the serious conditions that it's going to cause um, I think, gosh, there should be regulation on how much noise they can make. It's, yeah. it's out of control. Yeah. Every other ad is a drug ad. You got yeah, it. Yeah. And yeah. and they're all doing it. You're right. And this points to something else. Another, you said same people shifting jobs, kind of like turnstiles. Um, we talked about just styles and kind of there's books and codes of what is the new color trend or logo trend or building trend. But uh, there's another thing that really is, it, you got to break if you're an agency, you got to break it with your client. Every industry has an orthodoxy where they think mm-hmm. that like hospital advertising should all sound and look the same. How many smiling people on billboards can you see, right? Uh, yeah. um, and they, they, they have this idea that it has to look this way. And I think mm-hmm. that in itself creates commoditization or homogenization. And uh, I meant to send you, and I forgot, and I'm going to have to f- try and find this. I think it's the Huxley Healthcare System that's in Flint and Ann Arbor. They have an all green billboard, and it only has words on it. With their and they have different divisions, so they have like a children's hospital. Mm-hmm. And I remember this. It said most of our patients aren't old enough to read this billboard. Mm. And it was Children's Hospital. I thought that was genius. I mean, I was like, it's something like that. I'm going to have to find it. So maybe we can find it. Well, it breaks from the norm, whether it's effective or not. At least it breaks from the norm and people are going to notice it. And and they had several billboards for different specialties that had as much a clever kind of thought that you wouldn't associate. I thought that is bold, that is simple, that is clean, and it's unique. 
and yep. um, kudos to them. Well, let's stop there for today. Okay. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. If you haven't liked, subscribed, shared, subscribed, told your friends about the Brain Shorthand podcast and subscribed, please make sure to do that. And if I forget to mention it, please make sure to subscribe. And until next time, have an amazing day. Monday. Ain't nobody's business but my own.